pledge I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, and under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Only gas for a few of us. Okay. Uh, we'll start with public comments. Um, I will just note that I am going to um, entertain public questions from the public after the update on the gas crisis. So if you have a question related to that, you can wait. Any other public comments we could take now? Helen Picard, 447 Waverly Road. Um, I just wanted to comment tonight um, and thank you for your responsiveness to the community, especially with regards to the gas crisis, um, and also particularly um, for your responsiveness in a proclamation of Indigenous Peoples Day later tonight. Thank you. Mark Bohr, 10 Heath Circle. I also wanted to thank you for your proclamation on Indigenous Peoples Day. And um, I had promised a poem that night, but uh, it's ready tonight. So if I have your forbearance, it's short. I'll, I'd like to read it, if that's Please. okay. Yes. It's time for Indigenous Peoples Day, a poem. First, it's not true that I can only speak in rhyme. I can't talk that way on cue, and who has the time? I can only say what I say, and for that I'm not sorry. Poets arrange words this way. We want to tell a story. Columbus explored, for that he's rightly known. But as we've learned some more, our knowledge has only grown. In the story we all learned, some chapters were left out. Other people here, they yearn to be heard without having to shout. Columbus changed the world, and at our alma maters, one thing will never change. He'll remain an important man. But as history has unfurled, the distance has made some things clearer. We don't want the lesson shortchanged. We want our kids to learn to truly understand. We want our kids to read from all the missing chapters. We want our kids to gain from every class completely. We want our kids to know that books can have many authors. We want our kids to hear the story of our entire human family. If that means we change the name from time to time of some of our favorite holidays, then I believe, if I may claim, we shall be a little better, and in the end, I believe we shall even be okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Okay. Moving on, we have the minutes from our September 10th meeting. I'm sure I'll make a motion that we accept the meeting minutes from September 10th as written. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes. Great. The next item on our agenda is an update on Columbia gas crisis. Town manager will walk us through this. Well, everybody, we thought it was uh, certainly appropriate to give you an update as to the events that uh, first began uh, last Thursday, September 13th, to give you some perspective and provide some additional information. I know uh, that the board has a significant knowledge as it relates to many of these things, um, but I, the public may or may not, depending upon how communication has uh, developed over the last week plus. I would recognize, uh, first of all, all those families displaced, all those families that were impacted. Um, this was uh, tragic in many ways, uh, fortunate in some in that given the time of the day, uh, the weather, uh, the fact that nobody was injured, no firefighter was injured, no resident was injured. Uh, we did not have some of the same um, uh, sort of injury, certainly in loss of life, and some of the other issues that came up in some of the other communities. So, we're, if there is something fortunate to take uh, from a very tragic circumstance that continues to uh, go on and will go on, quite frankly, for several weeks, is that uh, in some cases or for some reasons, the, the factors that affected what happened in North Andover 
um, certainly could have been worse. I'd also like to take the opportunity to recognize uh, not only these folks who sit in the back row, uh, and I can talk a little bit about them, but everybody else. I mean, it, it's impossible, and I'm, I'm not, uh, you folks know that I'm not the most skilled at remembering everybody who should be uh, complimented or, or supported or acknowledged, but it, it is in some ways almost impossible to recognize that. Because in addition to the staff who have been um, extraordinary, uh, the public safety folks, the first responders who have been beyond extraordinary, and the regional uh, support and outpouring from other public safety agencies, from the state uh, and federal officials, from the governor's office, the governor himself, and really the neighbor to neighbor street to street support um, that the community has um, shown since September 13th is not only a recognition of uh, the community um, that we support, live and work in, but also of the uh, state and country that we live in. Uh, we're fortunate to possess uh, the skill uh, combined with an empathy that just doesn't exist everywhere. And so for those of you who could have seen the almost surreal setting of September 13th and 14th especially, uh, from the road, from the air, if you could have seen it, certainly those folks who were impacted uh, directly, um, it was a time that will uh, resonate with all of us for, for um, quite a while. And we should take from that that we're very, very fortunate to be surrounded by uh, good people who work hard and who care. So I think I want to recognize um, all of those folks. Again, uh, most of the most directly impacted senior staff members, uh, all of these folks have worked since September 13th, I think straight through in one form or another. Um, some of them close to 24 hours a day, certainly parts of every day since that point. Uh, what happened after the immediate um, events of September 13th, and we'll go through those, there are ongoing things every day, right? The discussion haven't, hasn't stopped. And I think one of the things I want the rec residents to recognize, whether you're impacted or not, is, is there continues to be meetings every day and discussions every day and um, effort exerted every day by these folks, by other staff members, by the Board of Selectmen, uh, to make sure that we get through the balance of what this um, extraordinary event has uh, caused in terms of impact on people's lives. So with that, um, again, I know it's a broad brush at some point, we'll, we'll probably in the future be able to take a step back and truly reflect on everybody's um, impact. But I think it's important to recognize that um, there, was a, there was a tremendous amount of people that, that, that led a response and continue to lead a response uh, as relates to the gas crisis. So let's talk about that. So first up is a map of the affected area. Uh, it's, a, it's a rough map, in essence, represents uh, self, what they refer to as South Lawrence, parts of Andover, speci uh, specifically around their Main Street corridor. And what uh, Columbia Gas refers to as Zone 8 and Zone 7 in North Andover, um, in broad terms, uh, bounded by Mass Ave, Main Street, Waverly, and Chickering, um, plus or minus within those spaces of some extensions across uh, Chickering, uh, diagonally toward DPW. But generally, that gives you a sense of where the sort of meets and bounds were of the event. The event was caused by an overpressurization of the low pressure gas side of the gas system. The gas system has low pressure lines and high pressure lines. It was on the low pressure side that there was an overpressurization. I will leave to the NTSB, a federal agency, and the state and others to determine the specific nature of what went on, who's at fault, and everything associated with that. We just know that the event took place. And, and by uh, late afternoon on that Thursday, I became aware as we received uh, 31 to 32 calls of service, depending on how you match those up, and, and calls to the dispatch area north of 200, that something was ongoing. And um, if you've listened to the dispatch tape, the fire response dis dispatch tape, which I have posted online as well, I mean, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary in terms of the response. It's extraordinary in terms of the, the fear in many ways for someone who's a civilian like, like myself listening to what was going on. It's tremendous in terms of the balance and composure of the professionals who responded. Um, and at the same time, you realize you're in an environment that you can't quite figure out what's going on. Uh, you don't know what the reason is why there's multiple fires at Andover, North Andover, and, and Lawrence. It's just not a common occurrence. So all of the things you could imagine uh, cross your mind at the time you're listening to this. Uh, begin around 4, again, uh, a little earlier than 4 p.m. Uh, the fires uh, tragically killed one person, the person in South Lawrence, caused dozens of injuries, store, destroyed homes, and led to the town of North Andover um, uh, telling all residents they should evacuate the homes if they had gas service. That was early in the evening on 
uh, Thursday. Mobile Command Center was stood up in Lawrence uh, for first responders. That happened a little after 5 o'clock, I believe was the time. Uh, we had started, uh, there was a command center set up in North Andover specifically as well that was at the St. Michael's School parking lot, originally was the staging area. It just became evident fairly quickly that this was impacting so many people in such a broad range of area that uh, the state uh, mobilized a command center at the, um, at the former Showcase Center in Lawrence uh, to respond regionally to what had turned into a regional issue. 32 properties were impacted in North Andover, four, four uh, remain what they call restricted access, four have limited access, and 24 had minor damage, and there were more than 200 calls to 911 related to this. For those people driving the streets at the time or in their neighborhoods, um, even while these fires are going on, you could drive through certain impacted neighborhoods and just smell gas at a level that you realize there was an ongoing issue. As it relates to the timeline, on Thursday, uh, we started to tell folks uh, shortly after the event began to evacuate their homes. We were uncertain of the sort of meets and bounds at that point of the event itself, where it began, where it ended. We didn't know the, the extent of the problem and recommended that they voluntarily evacuate their homes. At this point, emergency management activated to open a shelter at the high school, the staging area for most of the fire apparatus and public safety apparatus was at the middle school. Uh, many of the residents turned out after the fact, there's some data in the right-hand column, we had a, a total 2,503 residents, non-impacted, who shut off their own gas or had a relative friend plumber shut off the gas, which turned into another logistical challenge after the end of the event. Upon of identification of the impacted areas in the early uh, of Thursday evening from the command center, National Grid made, as the electric company, made the recommendation that the impacted area electricity be shut off as a precaution. Uh, we agreed to do that. Uh, electricity, like gas, is not a home-by-home -home switch. So in essence, 2,000 residents saw our electricity cut uh, where we had identified, a gas company had identified about 1,517 meters. So more residents lost electricity than did gas as, uh, as a precaution to make sure there wasn't further sort of impact in those areas. Uh, the state had begun to close highway ramps off of 495 to North Andover and the surrounding communities. Uh, and the emergency management team was identified before mobilized and set up a shelter at the high school. Uh, that day didn't really end, although we were showing discrete days. The Thursday, September 13th piece rolls into very, very early on Friday morning. The, the command center in Lawrence was uh, just uh, remarkable was the only word I, I can use in terms of the commitment of assets. Mass emergency management, state fire marshal, our own public safety officials, uh, myself, officials from each of the surrounding communities, the governor, all were in a, a command center making decisions to try to uh, understand the issue and reduce the impact. Came evident was that uh, all of the meters that were impact needed to be shut off. And there wasn't any sense yet of whether some were and some weren't. And so, uh, Columbia Gas was, was the lead utility. They owned the utility infrastructure, and, and Columbia Gas was charged to going door to door to shut off all of the meters. By the way, 1,517 in North Andover, close to 8,600 total between the three impacted communities. Uh, Lawrence at that point had indicated there was a mandatory evacuation. We just encouraged folks to move from their homes. Uh, Columbia Gas began, the, began that process somewhere between uh, 2 a.m. and 2.30 a.m. on Friday morning to stop the shutoff process at each and every one of the meters. We had both police and fire folks with Columbia Gas staff. I'll never remember, uh, forget that morning. It was uh, remarkably foggy, um, which we don't see a lot of fog around here, and it was notably foggy. It just seemed almost surreal as they were going door to door in the dark, beginning to shut off the 1,517 meters. Um, as some attempt to make sure that we could control, shut off the impacted area, and then ultimately the goal was to restore um, electricity. Later on that day, it became evident that there was some, Columbia uh, Gas was experiencing some real logistical challenges in getting those meters turned off. It was not going uh, as well as anybody planned. Uh, quite frankly, there weren't enough assets in any of the communities to get that done. Now, the governor, based on that response by mid to late afternoon, um, decided that he would declare a state of emergency which allowed him to move Columbia Gas aside and bring on Eversource to coordinate the shutoff of the remaining of the gas uh, meters. That was in the late afternoon on Friday. Uh, the process it ramped up again to begin to shut off each of these meters, 1,517 again in North Andover and about 8,600 in total uh, through the region. Uh, progress was, you know, steadily made and was nearly complete in the early evening of uh, September, Saturday, September uh, 15th. 
uh, not completed, but but substantially completed. There was a decision made about whether or not electricity could be turned on at that point. And again, understand when electricity shut off and the process they go through to do that, they can't just flip a switch to bring it all back on. So. Uh, the decision was made since we didn't want folks returning home in the middle of the night with questions about their gas that the more logical uh, step would be to get try to get everybody on by 7 a.m. on Sunday morning uh, and they were able to work through the night and get really close to that I think put some stats here we had by Sunday morning 7 a.m. Sunday morning 92 percent of all uh, folks had seen the gas shut off in the impacted area and electricity return they were down to sort of a handful of of individual folks and I think by 10 a.m. that was 99.1 percent. So at that point, uh, first thing in the morning on Sunday, we made the decision to close the shelter and close the shelter at 1 o'clock with folks having electricity. The shelter made less sense. Uh, we don't often operate shelters. Uh, in this case, it was done in conjunction with the American Red Cross and some of you folks are showing up in remarkable sort of volunteerism and contrib contribution by many of the restaurants. And so uh, we had seen general decrease in the amount of folks at the shelter as the electricity came on and the decision was made to close the shelter at 1 o'clock. So that phase had been complete, which was to shut off the meters and to restore electricity. Um, Talking specifically about the shelter, it was opened in the early evening of September 13th. It operated through September 16th. Uh, the emergency management folks, along with uh, several of the selectmen and others, uh, were there to support that. Um, it, was, it was a tremendous outpouring. Uh, it really helped families at a time that they really needed it. Uh, the food and other donations were extraordinary. It was truly an example of residents coming together. Um, it was a pretty dramatic effort that I think Mr. Valancourt can speak to of trying to get what was left over and bring it to food shelters and food pantries in Lawrence to make sure that the food that had been donated would help others as well. Uh, the next phase was, so a phase is sort of missing in these slides, but to understand, once the gas was shut off and the electricity was returned, that's when we uh, determined through call. So a call was made to tell folks, if you had shut off your gas as a precaution and want to get it back on, we need to work with Columbia Gas to coordinate a response to do that. Um, I think if you had asked me at the time how many people as a precaution shut off the gas, if 1,517 were impacted and couldn't get them turned back on, I would have thought a couple of hundred. It turned out to be 2,500. And so, again, trying to remobilize the Columbia Gas crowd and get them out to turn on those 2,500 meters uh, took uh, a while, it took a couple of days. I think the response was reasonable, uh, but it took a couple of days to get everybody back up and running. So everybody who was no longer in an impacted area had gas within two days of that Sunday, I think somewhere in the uh, Tuesday morning realm. That sort of completed the, that phase of things. We had begun to think about um, claims, how folks would file claims. Columbia Gas was working on the process to manage claims. We in North Andover made a conscious decision to set up a center which we thought would be both a claims and resource center to provide more, more than just claims information to residents if they needed it, other kinds of resources. Uh, we worked with the Greater Lawrence Community Action Council to deal with housing related concerns. Um, we were dealing with uh, the Mass Division of Insurance to have people come in to be able to answer questions about property insurance. We've had a staff member there each day to answer, you know, a senior staff member answering questions. Uh, I think Chris McClure has pretty much lived there to make sure that they had uh, the information technology they needed. Remember, this was an empty storefront. Uh, the Messinas have been fantastic. They've, in essence, donated the storefront to us. Uh, it's nearly 6,000 square feet. It logistically processes to date over 1,400 claims. Um, it's done so in a way that I think is respectful and efficient. They have 10 full time claims reps along with management. Um, and a lot of other resources. So as you can imagine, setting up overnight, in essence, a claim center. Uh, Mrs. Santilli was a great help as well. Getting that center up and running, getting the logistics done, making sure it was all set up the way they needed. And by the way, creating up a sort of wireless network to make sure that these folks can process claims wirelessly, providing a public Wi-Fi network, all that stuff was done. Uh, I'm sure the sort of professionalism and expertise of our staff in about 24 hours. And that opened at noon on Wednesday of last week, again, through uh, Saturday had processed somewhere around 1,400 claims. Uh, we're using that location as shown up here uh, to also provide the response as relates to the hot plates. That's where folks can pick them up. Uh, we had an original allotment of hot plates, I think 300. Um, we got a second allotment of close to 700 to supplement that, and and we we didn't we got through the 300 and a couple more after that and. Uh, beginning tomorrow when the, uh, the claim center reopens, they'll begin to distribute the hot plates that people have, have requested. 
So again, at that claim center, it's the place for residents to go if they have a claim. It operates uh, Tuesday through Saturday, give the people an opportunity to know where to go. We have a direct uh, space heater number. So the second phase of this sort of um, response phase to help folks through the transitional period was to also afford them space heaters. Uh, this is the 1-800 number on this screen. We'll put it on the town's website. You can call that number. They will come with a licensed electrician. Make sure that your home can handle the, the load of the space heater. They'll also insto install a smoke and uh, carbon monoxide detector, something that uh, Chief McCarthy and his fellow uh, chiefs in the region are required. Uh, the hot plates come with a series of safety instructions, which again were uh, developed with the help of the, uh, the fire chiefs uh, to make sure that it's appropriate. And, and so there's a 1-800 number that folks can call to do that. Uh, the next phase, so this is the one pager, and again, all this stuff is on the town's website, and we're going to talk about communication at the end of this, but this is where residents have been going. We understand that they can continue in this location for the foreseeable future. We have not placed an end date on this claim center, and it became more important as we were able to, on uh, set late Saturday, get Columbia Gas to articulate more clearly as to what they would reimburse. The conversion to an alternative fuel, as an example, was something that came up um, on Saturday. So the restoration process, uh, since there was a uh, state of emergency identified by the governor, he was able to uh, place someone in charge other than Columbia. Uh, Eversource had completed its sort of logistical pieces as it relates to the shutoffs. It made some sense to bring in someone who had an understanding of large scale construction uh, processes. He tapped uh, Navy Captain retired Joe Albanese, who's also the founder and CEO of Commodore Builders, which is a construction management company. Uh, he was identified as the chief recovery officer. He will be coordinating uh, more than a thousand staff in various areas of making this restoration process happen. I think what we got from Friday was this. If you're in the impacted area, although there'll be creative ways to try to reduce those folks impacted, the assumption you have to make is that you will not have gas through November 19th. That was, was what said Friday, and we continue to repeat those dates. Everybody hopes and believes it can be earlier, but I think from the beginning what we've tried to do is identify or get the Columbia Gas and others to identify uh, what that window would be so that people can start to prepare accordingly. The restoration process uh, started today. There were some Columbia Gas crews in the town. There'll be a ramping up of the number of Columbia gas crews in the community. Every one of the low pressure services has to be replaced. In some cases, that won't mean digging up the existing low pressure service. They may sleeve a high pressure service through it. So there are several different ways to accomplish this. In some cases, working with our engineering staff, Jim Stanford from DPW, and the two other DPW directors from the other impacted communities, um, and engineering staff and the folks that are being headed up by Mr. Albanese, we found locations where high pressure main have, has been installed or is proximate to low pressure main in areas where we can connect over to the high pressure main rather than having to dig up the whole line, making the restoration for certain people in certain neighborhoods and certain assets go quicker. A good example of that is the ongoing work on Route 125 uh, near Shadi's that hopefully will bring up that strip mall, the DPW facility, uh, an auto body place in that area that may allow us a short-term win other than waiting to, for November 19th. So you need to know that our engineering staff is aggressively working with the parties here to find creative ways using other high pressure infrastructure in the town uh, to get some people up sooner. It will not impact everybody. It's not going to be, it's not going to make November 19th become, you know, October 1st for many people. But we are working on those kinds of uh, creative solutions with uh, the Columbia Gas folks and the Chief Restoration Recovery Officer. Another example, so you know, is that working with almost everybody in the staff here, we've created a series of listed a series of high priority assets, including Foles Terrace and Bingham Way, two of our senior housing facilities, to find ways to bring those facilities on sooner. Um, we've provided that list to Columbia Gas and and uh, Joe Albanese. They're working to see if there are high pressure mains in the area. We think that's also a possible early win to try to address uh, the impact on some of our housing authorities. <coughs> um, one of the restoration phases be in, ad in addition to this construction phase, I do, uh, should know by form of statistic, there are 48 uh, miles of main that need to be replaced, either sleeved and replaced or dug up and replaced. If you do that in the form of linear feet, it's something north of 300,000 linear feet of pipe. Um, and in the end, as they start to ramp up this a substantial construction and assessment phase, uh, there'll be a total of 195 crews stationed between the three communities. We don't have 
um, on a busy gas replacement day, which we've had some, we don't have more than a half a dozen crews. I would say more like three or four. And so in North Andover, you will see a couple dozen crews at a time, um, and there will be impact in the entire region as it relates to traffic and other related items as, as they do some of this work, and we've made people aware of that. Um, we have, uh, with agreement by all of the parties, hired our own project manager, owner's project manager. It's the same company between all three communities. You'll have a point of contact that'll work with the engineering staff of each of the communities to make sure that in addition, to Mr. Albanese's staff as recovery officer overseeing the work of whoever the contractors are doing the gas main replacement, we'll have our own eyes and ears there to make sure that we can provide the kind of feedback and we can add sort of another layer of trust in, uh, to the process. And so that has happened. The communities have coordinated together to issue one procurement to do that. And there'll be a single person working for one uh, engineering firm We'll have staff at each of these individual sites reporting back and then reporting back to our engineering staff to make sure that all of that work is happening efficiently. Uh, teams will begin, teams of approximately four will begin assessments of each and every property. Some calls went out today. I know some residents have spoken have received those calls. Those calls will again begin to ramp up. Every resident in the impacted area will be contacted to schedule uh, a visit of what I'm calling an assessment team, licensed electrician, licensed plumber, um, a gas technician, and they will go through the house and in some cases spend several hours evaluating the infrastructure in the home, the appliances, heating system, and all the rest of the information. In the end, all of the gas work needs to be done and all of the assessments need to be done, other than in these cases where there's more creative alternatives to get to this November 19th date. So you can imagine how many crews, if you just simply do the math, of 8,600 meters divided by four people, divided by the number of days to get this done, how many crews it's gonna to take to get all of this done. And that's why there was a, an employment center that was set up and there's a significant amount of ramping up to get all of the staff in place to do this kind of work. I think they're gonna need north of 300 licensed, Massachusetts licensed plumbers. Um, and they're working toward that and they um, have commitments from, from numbers that are approaching that. So this process will ramp up over time. Uh, we've given you the general restoration timeline. Uh, about that, 24th was the construction teams. There's a venting process beginning tomorrow in several neighborhoods in North Andover. We've put something out through our news to, to folks about that. Um, there might be a minor smell of gas. It's a safe process, but we've published that on the town's website so you know where that's going to be. That's the first part of then beginning uh, the replacement process. We'll continue to communicate that. Talked about the assessments. The ongoing effort to locate creative efficient restorations are the ones that we've talked about, like the Housing Authority and like on 125. We'll continue to work with them. We think there's some Main Street options where there was some high pressure main already installed. We think there's some options along Mass Ave as well. So we'll continue to have our engineering staff work with with the recovery team's engineering staff to find creative solutions to bring some people on sooner. Uh, communication, sorry for this, this slide is a little small. Um, the amount of communication <coughs> has been multifaceted, dynamic, and at times uh, fantastic, and at times probably folks not feel not so fantastic. But I think we've attempted to really broaden the method of communication to recognize that people uh, communicate in many different platforms to get their information. The town's website has been one uh, point. It should be noted that at 619 of the night of the event, uh, with Mr. McClure's help, we established um, a hashtag MV gas fire banner right center in the town's website. It was at 619 of the night of the event. Since that night, there's a now a direct link to that, which is listed above. If you click on that link, you'll get to that banner. It literally provides a communication by communication um, timeline of everything that's been communicated by the town since 619 on September 3rd. There's been 85 posts to that. Everything we can from claims information to everything that was going on at the time. So you see the most recent post and you can click on the history and go all the way back to September 13th. Uh, the SMART 911 system was used. The first SMART alert was made at 6.02 p.m. the night of the event. It targeted 8,927 users. There's been nine alerts since that time. Um, the last group targeted 9864. The reason for the increase, of course, is we are seeing a dramatic increase in people's interest to participate. We've seen that on Twitter and Facebook, the Smart 911, and every form we have, folks are signing up to get information. And so, which is great, and it's positive for us that people are using these resources to communicate. 
There have been 41 email out updates for those folks who, uh, who uh, if we put out an email or signed up to get the email, uh, and there are, I think we're over 1,400 folks who now get those email updates. There have been 14,590 preloaded landlines in the system. So in addition to these sort of targeted lines, we do have 14,590 preloaded telephone numbers that every time we issue a robocall, those folks get a call. On the Twitter side, on both my Twitter and the, town, the town's Twitter, we've tweeted at least 100 times regarding the incident. We've seen an increase of more than 1,300 Twitter followers. I think uh, split about evenly. I th my Twitter uh, account has gone up by about 650 in the town. Similarly, uh, between the two, there's now more than 6,000 people following the two accounts on Twitter. And that doesn't account for about 7,000 people following the police department on Twitter. Uh, to date, we've had more than two, thousand, uh, two dozen press conferences or interviews to try to communicate information um, to the public and media. Uh, uh, Facebook has seen an increase of 685 followers with the help of some volunteers. And again, the selectmen's help. There was a door-to-door -door distribution yesterday of the hard copy of the claims information. It didn't reach everybody, but I think it was certainly a solid attempt to get out there. And we've done the same thing at the library and the claim center. Um, there's also additional forms downstairs here at Town Hall and in other venues, and of course, Kim has been you know, alongside us all the way, making sure that there um, are the kinds of communications that we'd expect to the public. Uh, I should also note, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of things. Uh, one is that haven't identified some of the staff. Uh, Gene Enright is working with the two economic developments from the other two communities. Uh, there's some conversation now, right now through me of bringing the Small Business Association. We're working with them on that. I can tell you that we have, at this point, uh, the fewest businesses impacted of any of the three communities. It was about uh, 7 o'clock when I asked the folks out back. Um, I think we're down to four or five remaining restaurants that are not open. And it sounds like we're within a reasonable time frame of trying to get those folks back up. Uh, which is really positive. In some cases, um, using Andover specifically, when Main Street was impacted, I think they lost north of 60 businesses at the time. And so um, everybody was impacted in a slightly different way. It was, although it was a regional event, uh, each community sort of had its own persona in terms of how it was impacted, and we're working around that. So although we've worked collectively to try to uh, bring regional uh, resources to this kind of problem, each of uh, myself, the town manager in Andover, and the mayor of Lawrence have recognized that each of our communities were impacted differently, and the response needed to be nuanced to reflect that. Um, one other person who has been a sort of nonstop in his way to help businesses to be creative, to find solutions, and has been an extraordinary asset is Paul Hutchinson, who's uh, here, a building inspector, sorry, Hutchinson. Um, and he has been, uh, I'm not sure he's gone home, but uh, that's okay. We like him anyway, and he's been around. He identified an early problem uh, that was, was brought back uh, to the group, to the command staff, about the possibility of an impact on boilers in the long term. He's been a great a resource through that. and. Um, certainly the PD, which I, again, I, I'm sure I'm leaving folks out, but uh, Chuck Ray has, uh, Chuck Ray was driving me around five minutes into the event and has been uh, omnipresent in many, many ways. So uh, all of these folks have had an influence on making sure that our response is thorough and we continue to try to find ways to do that and serve residents. We do know it's a long haul. We continue to try to push the state and Columbia Gas to find ways to bring gas service on sooner. Uh, but we want to set realistic expectations as well so people can begin to prepare. So with that, here's some additional websites uh, that folks can contact. There's some unemployment benefit options, and mass revenue assistance is also helping taxpayers. I would note at the bottom there that the YMCA uh, was an early, early return to service and communicated with us very early on that they would allow residents of North Andover, members or not, to go to the North Andover Y, which is a fantastic facility, the Andover North Andover Y, use the showers, use the workout facilities, use the free Wi-Fi. Uh, they're a fantastic partner and continue to be, and we know that it's an important resource. So with that, uh, I'll answer any questions you may have. Um, I had uh, one question, and it's, maybe it would, it answers itself, it's probably actually more for Paul, who is in the back of the room. So when they're assessing the houses that, um, are down, for lack of a better word. If do they have to be somewhat functional? S because I guess you're um, inspecting for appliances and things like that. But if the house is shuttered and there's a few, mine included, would you still need to go in to see if, like, your gas stove is still functional, or do, is that will that come when the house comes back for its final inspection to be 
Um, That'll come as being be rebuilt. Okay. Um, and then. Wait, can I just mm -hmm. clarify that? The four, the teams of four that are coming through to inspect to see what's the situation in the house that's happening in the next like three weeks. They're not so it's going to be able to. Three weeks. Well, so oh, right. right. Sorry. Just want to be clear. Yeah. That's happening before the November 19th date. They can't check a gas stove, for example, because there's no gas coming to the stove, no, the so they question, can't assess it? Or the question they? was specific to houses that were impacted, for instance, by fire or the boiler. So that, let's call those the 32, of which it was of that eight, which were seriously impacted, including the Smidaleys. That's a completely separate animal than everybody else. But that, so the other impacted homes that yeah, were not damaged that. by fire, they'll be able to check those stoves, yes. even though there's no gas to the stove. They're going to check the stoves. They're going to check all gas appliances, dryers, stoves. Okay. What else am I missing? <laughs> dryers, uh, stoves, water heater, uh, hot water heaters only. Uh, one thing I didn't identify, and I apologize, and I knew I would do it from the beginning. Um, Brian Lagrasse is here from from the health department. They went they went business by business um, and asked what the businesses needed. I think it was a big help in identifying one, giving businesses, a, you know comfortable sense that people were thinking about their particular needs, not every business, but certain kinds of businesses that the health department directly gets involved in. As a function of that, we're able to identify some of the solutions which could be provided to get people up and running. So they were fantastic business asset early on in the problem and continue to be to make sure we can get those businesses up and running. See, the other question that I had, and um, so a lot of the families, a lot of the, the residents in town do get the robocalls. But if you would like them also to, to their homes, if you would like them also to your cell phone, what is the means to sign them up for that? Yeah, the town's website is the best route, and we, uh, we had switched from one system to the other around July 1, and we put out about a dozen uh, push notices to folks and news to get people switched. But obviously, um, you know, that's always a little slow. So they get onto the town's website. They can sign up very easily. They can put multiple numbers and they want multiple email addresses so that's the best way to do it we have seen a dramatic climb in that obviously during this event by more than a thousand but if folks want to do that and they're not currently getting it they just go on the town's website that's the best way to do it okay yeah probably everybody should put yes. a, sure. as much contact as possible you know if Agreed. they're at work and they don't know what's going on it, it costs us no more and no more effort to, to communicate to one person than a hundred thousand and so I agree. If there are multiple means of communication you're comfortable with, and the system we switch to is is far, far more dynamic in terms of its ability to communicate to, res communicate to residents. So I would encourage you to put multiple numbers and multiple forms mm -hmm. of contact. That's, that's I know it could be a little annoying if you get three or four items, but... Everything's it, dinging at once. Everything, and it does happen. But um, at least it provides the residents an opportunity to be aware of what's going on. I just have to make this comment for what sometimes some people think is the robocalls on town business is a little bit of a nuisance. Boy, you don't, you wouldn't say that anymore. So it's, it's been a real asset. What do we have off of that? Like at our senior center, for instance, I know that I got a lot of contact from people who weren't online following Twitter and Facebook, but a lot of our seniors at our center do have cell phones. And so do we have a resource down there to help sign up as many of those members as possible in the system so that their cell phones are on that yep. list as well? I think a lot of them probably have landlines, but just making sure that they sure. go and update their profiles on the RAVE system so their cell phone number gets the text alerts. I know that there's been training for all the people, the major staff members in terms of how to do that, but we can just reemphasize to make sure that the staff members down there know how folks can sign up. Yep, not a problem at all. Um, so I just wanted to say I, I, I don't think we can understate enough or overstate enough the, the mutual aid that we received from fire and police. I think the uh, North Carolina Fire Department put a, uh, a graphic out of the number of fire departments in the area that responded. And having had an opportunity to go over to the uh, command center and seeing the number of first responders that were there and the, the coordination and the logistics behind that was just amazing how, you know, they, they just had everything clicking over there in such a short period of time. It was just, I, I don't know if you have a number of police and fire that uh, p actual respond, first responders, but it was unbelievable how and very impressive to see how how well coordinated that was and how everybody was working together also the town staff um, you know did unbelievable job keeping people informed trying to keep people safe um, volunteers at the shelter we had people that were just going home from work 
And this one woman was a licensed nurse. She lived in Havel. She was going home from work. She heard about it. She came to the shelter. She stayed all night helping the elderly and helping people coming in. So uh, we had unbelievable numbers of volunteers. And there were other people like that, too, that were just driving by. And actually, some people that were there um, that were being sheltered stepped up and started helping people and, and stayed all weekend to help people. So it was amazing, the volunteers, and, then, and the generosity of the residents and the businesses in the area. We, uh, again, at that shelter, we had businesses coming in with food and coffee and um, everything for the res clothing for the uh, for the people there and as well as residents too just coming by with all kinds so really it was an am amazing response by people and just uh, really um, you know great to see that uh, so I would like to just add are you finished we might have uh, something else so. um, just to add to that um, this I don't really cry but this makes me emotional to see the f the fire department from all these different communities running into my house as they're adding a new pack because they only could stay in for 10 minutes because the heat in my basement and the kindness and the effort that they put in from all over. I mean, we had Haverhill, Essex, um, Londonderry, York, uh, Boxford, Topsfield, and the kindness and compassion that they showed in the, they were exhausted just watching them and when they finally put it out, um, just the sense of pride that they did it. So I cannot thank them enough. And of course, everybody has heard that I have three heroes, um, two 11-year-old boys that saw the fire in my house and told their parents. And they probably saved my house and my pets. And of course, uh, Chief Gray literally went in and, and grabbed my pets. The bird I just found out was on the bottom of the cage with the wings spread out. We have a little parakeet that was my son's. And even that meant a lot to us because he talks and he's quite entertaining and we really love him at our house. But uh, I, I, uh, I know it's kind of funny, but it was, and the chief went in, flew in, got the animals and back in the car and was saving people's lives, getting people. I, I just, um, it's amazing to have seen it. Um, so you should be very proud of your department, um, departments, both chiefs, because I'm really proud of them both and the ones that came and just kept going back in and working and working to um, help their neighbors in need. So, and I think, and I missed some of the great things that you just told me. I, I didn't know all about the shelter. I was not available was for really, that, but. Uh, great to see people coming in. Yeah. You know, even the first responders were coming in, and yep. so it was, it was amazing. And the backup with our, the rest of our staff, the Board of Health, our building department, I, you just, you could go on for hours and, Thank you very much. That's all I can say. My family thanks you, and I know a lot of other families do as well. Good job, guys. Good job. Yeah. Maybe bring it down a little bit. A question about Columbia Gas mm -hmm. and their response. I mean, what we're what I'm seeing and hearing a lot of is that their response is, has been less than optimal for time frames that they're giving people and um, you know some of the definitions like around reasonable costs and things like that about what they're going to replace. I mean, do we see anything where they, they bring on additional resources that they maybe can get people um, at least comfortable and, and ensure that they, you know, we're going to get some, well, not we, I'm not affected, but some people, you know, they're going to get reimbursements for some of these conversions they're going to do. I know they, they've said that, but they, they've always got that reasonable cost clause in there. And do you think we'll get some more definition and some some further information on that and, and maybe some better response time, too, for some of the folks that, you know, when they're saying 72 hours, some people are saying, oh, that's, that's too long. I need to know now because I need to start making plans. What was the 72 hours? I've been hearing and seeing things where people have been saying that the um, Columbia Gas will get back to them in 72 hours. Yeah, how do I answer that? You know, I think that um, the problem is caused by Columbia Gas. Right? Um, everything we're talking about tonight is sort of our reaction collectively to an event that was not caused by us, but we're trying to assist. I think that with the declaration of a state of emergency, on Friday, things improved from where they were th overnight Thursday. And for those folks, several of which are in the room, uh, overnight Thursday was just, was not, um, didn't make us feel comfortable. Uh, I think things got, have gotten a little better over time. 
And I think uh, the governor's decision to place someone in charge as part of the declaration of emergency overseeing the response operation um, helps. We, we sit in those rooms, we listen to what's going on, and, and, and we see change in a way that's positive. I think the single page that was placed on the town's website Saturday about what they will cover was a dramatic change because up to that point they didn't talk about anything about conversion. They weren't responding to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that sheet is about as clear as you're going to get. And I think it's, in fairness, it's reasonable in the sense that <clears throat> I would expect every, any entity who's standing out insurance claims to use the term reasonable. It's one of those terms you'll use. I will continue to push them to make sure reasonable airs on the side of the customer. And that's what we feel like is part of our role as they go through the claims process. Um, so we get mixed sentiment back on that. I think there's, um, I think the resources have improved. A lot of the resources in terms of getting in people's homes and doing the work. Uh, those will mostly be contract labor. You know, Columbia Gas does not replace the lines in the street. Columbia Bas Gas contract has replaced the line in the street. So we're seeing a different group of people with substantial construction experience overseeing the work that's going to happen on the roadway. The same group responsible for getting the assets, like hiring plum plumbers and electricians. So do I think it's going to be perfect? No. Do I think uh, that it's better day, better today than yesterday, and better yesterday than the day before? I do. And if there are individual cases where uh, what the Columbia Gas is saying is unreasonable, then I think we'll continue to push to advocate for our residents to make sure that the response is appropriate. I don't know about the 72 hours. I know that people going through the claim center are filling out documents. I think in some cases the response could be that, you know, given the, the sort of workload of what's going on. But I do feel every day uh, that the number of assets committed to this restoration process are dramatically increasing, and that will probably peak out about mid-October. I think folks will see a more and more uh, an improved response to that because the staffing is being increased every day to to address the questions that you have. Okay. Yep. Thanks. And I didn't because I knew I was going to miss folks. Uh, Steve Foster has been intimately involved in making sure that all of our schools were safe. Spent an extraordinary amount of time Saturdays and Sunday uh, making sure that he looked at every building with with the appropriate people uh, before we sent kids back to school, which we know for parents. I can imagine sending them back into an area where uh, some homes were impacted. So I want to recognize Stevie continues to work sort of in that regard to make sure that, that our schools and our public buildings are safe as well. And you, you worked really hard, I think, at channeling the town's energy and interest in getting Columbia Gas and the administration to prioritize reimbursing people who are looking to get the electric hot water heaters at their home so that way they don't go eight weeks without hot water. In fairness, what, what can we do? What more can we do as a board? What more can we do as a town? What more can we do with this administration at the state level to work with lower income residents who don't have the capital already in hand to retrofit and wait for a reimbursement? So it's a really good question. It was raised by Chief McCarthy today. Of course, I haven't recognized yet because he popped in from yet another problem uh, that he, he, he was great, responded to the fire department was fantastic as Rosemary identified and continues to be in terms of their investment and making sure that this phase is safe too, because I think people need to know that. Um, we're looking into ways to address that. Um, you know, I guess the phrase is maybe inappropriate spitballing a little bit. I've reached out to a couple of local banks. They're under some limitations because of the equity clause associated with giving loans. I've reached out to the Commonwealth to see if we can, we can do things in municipal government to extend that option to residents. I'm waiting for some responses on that. It's a little creative, this idea that we become sort of the lender. Um, we're looking at those kind of options. I'm working with the Mass Emergency Management to see if they can provide some authorization to do that kind of thing. So something like someone uh, has an interest to convert to electric, um, you know, a, let's say I'm, I'm picking a number. Say a reasonable cost, whatever that is, is $2,000. I've heard varying numbers, a lot of which are below $2,000, quite frankly. I'm separating boilers because I don't think you're going to get the same response on, on boilers. But let's talk about hot water. And something where someone could get a no-interest loan for two months, bring in a bill and say, it's going to be $1,500. Here it is from the plumber. And get a loan, be able to pay the person off so that they don't have to come out of pocket. And then when the reimbursement, then they process a claim for the reimbursement and somehow making that all work. So we are working that channel right now, okay. like we did on the channel that, that in, expanded the claims for residents. We're working that channel to try to find 
uh, creative ways to bridge the gap for those folks who, you know, taking $2,000 out of pocket, $1,500 out of pocket may be challenging. So we're continuing to work that piece of things. I think I've been able to narrow down those uh, entities that can help. Um, and, and hopefully in the next couple of days we can roll out some kind of program that would do that. I do think it's important. I think you recognize the need, but so the town has been coordinating with the schools and the youth center. We've been collecting gift cards mostly for food-related purchases, funneling them to St. Michael's Church where they've been handing them out to families that sign up in need from North Andover. And within 70 minutes they handed out all the gift cards to 39 families. And if families are, are struggling, and that's, this is a struggling time, if they're struggling to the point that they need small gift cards, as they, that's why they're there. It's just the $1,200, $1,500 purchase. I mean, it's, surely it's really easy for Columbia Gas and the powers that be at the state level to see why this is such an urgent need in all three communities. We, we agree, I mean, in a, um, in a world where North Andover is not part of a broader sort of government structure, I think we'd all agree tonight that we would spend the money and fold it to our residents and cover the cost and, and even placing it as a sort of a lien off a tax bill and could be deducted from a tax, I could get real creative, you know, shows up in your tax bill and then it's tax deductible from a tax basis. Um, we don't possess some of that authority, um, although it'd be neat to do, but we, we're aware of the issue, we're working with the players we think that uh, can maybe get that creative with us so that we can respond in a way that helps our residents. And do we, so right now Columbia Gas is going to be following up with people who have submitted claims to follow up and close that, close that loop, right? And so we've said there are 1,400 claims that have already been processed just in, since it's been opened, but there are 15, over 1,500 homes that were impacted. I think the home count yeah. might be lower than that because the, the meters, it might be, you know, two meters on one property. So I think we're about even with the give or take with the number of homes in But town. certainly there were people who lost power that have gas still, they yes. work in the impacted area that have Correct. gone and just processed yes. their small claims. And yeah. so are there any more ways that we're looking at getting this information out to just residents in general in the impacted area? Because clearly we're missing a chunk that you would think would have wanted to rush and not rush, uh, but quickly get this. We're open to different means. Again, we're using, it's a it's a multiple platform approach. It's it's Some of it is sort of electronic, certainly electronic, but dropping off the flyers as well. Again, cell phones, email, social media, um, We've been on, you know, radio, we've been on television, we'll continue to communicate that. I think if we track at the consistent pace we are, you know, so I'm not seeing, it wasn't as if it was, uh, you know, sort of 3, 3, 100, 100. It's been pretty uniform. So we'll look to see what happens through next week. If it continues at the sort of 300 folks or so a day, then that tells us we're going to reach a pretty aggressive saturation point to most of the folks. And then as the calls go out individually to um, residents for those assessments, you know, I think it's um, what we're going to want to make sure the assessment team has is that single page what they'll cover. So when you go to do the assessment, in addition to probably getting approval that day that your gas dryer and your gas stove are being replaced, here are the other things that we'd cover for. That'll get that form to each of the homes that are impacted as well. Okay. So sort of hand delivery, right? Yeah, well, which would be good. Yeah, the multi-pronged approach. Can I just uh, follow up on the St. Michael's? Um, just to make it clear that it's non-denominational, is collecting oh, the money. Yes. It's not just for St. Michael's parishioners, and it's ne not necessarily even just for North Andover rights. They made that pretty clear on Sunday. They did take a second collection to contribute to it, but it is, it is for anybody in need. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear. So just a brief to that. Um, so there is, there was the Greater Lawrence Disaster Relief Fund was created. It's part of the ECCF. It's its own sort of bank account and process, sort of outside of the conversation of our response to date. Uh, that fund will have north of $10 million in it. I would expect that we've been working aggressively to develop a fair and easy intake process that will affect every one of the, f the sort of meters impacted, every one of the residents. And there will be a process, you know, rolled out we think as early as later this week um, where folks could be able to file a claim against that fund to give them some additional monetary relief. Um, the specifics haven't been rolled out yet, but I think it'll be sort of a monetary response to every one of those folks. We'd expect uh, the Great Alliance Disaster Relief Fund representative trained to manage the intake process will also be placed at our resource center. It's part of the reason we're calling it a claims and resource center because we'd like to see folks go to one location and not have to go to various locations. So we're hoping to have more information on that later in the week. I think a point of clarification is that 
clarification, there was a flyer that went home to the schools suggesting that if people, parents, in the schools wanted to help North Andover kids impacted by this, they could send in gift cards at certain locations that St. Michael's would distribute those. So I think those gift cards were intended for North Andover families. Probably the second collection and other things exactly, are for more broadly, you know, for anyone. Yeah, but but just to clarify that in case people got that communication from the schools. Um, are you done with your questions? Yeah. Uh, I had a question about an, um, what we're doing um, and what the state is doing to ensure that the restoration work is being done in a safe manner and that that's not, you know, public safety isn't being compromised in an effort to yeah. restore all the pipe as quickly as possible. I know that's a concern I'm hearing from residents and sure. um, it's obviously an aggressive timeline. So can you share a little bit about what um, is being put in place to ensure yeah, it's that a that's great question that's been raised in a number of different platforms has been newspaper articles about it I think what took um, one of the more uh, difficult uh, challenges and this is not in any way rival the challenges facing our families but from those folks here working to try to give more information to the residents one of the real challenges was sort of gap between Sunday when para came on and Friday when um, it, the plan was revealed because folks kept on saying what's the plan what's the plan what's the plan and, and that period uh, was really about making sure that what was going to be proposed could be delivered right I, sitting in those meetings don't over promise however bad it is promise what you can do deliver on big issue and make sure that you have the safety um, integrated into the plan to make sure that folks feel comfortable about the process. And I can tell you that's part of the reason why it, it seemed like those four days seemed sort of long. I know they seem long to the residents given the, given the feedback I received about those kind of things. Having been involved in those daily conversations now with the folks that are participating and overseeing this process uh, would make people comfortable, should make people comfortable. The resources included, the oversight, a redundant oversight by putting an OPM on top of the OPM that's going to be managed in the project. Uh, those kinds of folks will not just be, you know, there'll be there'll be contractors working in the street, but there'll be um, uh, zone commanders who are not Columbia Gas people overseeing the work in this, the eight zones. There'll be additional engineering staff. We've implemented engineering staff over that for the very purpose of making sure that what goes in and what gets done is safe. And so it doesn't seem like, it, it did seem like a long time at the time, but those days were really spent asking those questions repeatedly to make sure that the plan got rolled, that it got rolled out was a safe plan. And again, that includes the kinds of sort of belts and suspenders to make sure the professional staff is overseeing the construction projects and that the adequate crews are there to install it within the timeline provided not just putting out a date and rushing through work, but they're talking about adding 195 crews at the peak of this. Again, I can't give you a magnitude of that. You, you have not seen 195 work crews probably in aggregate over a three-year period in North Andover, and they're talking about 195 crews working within the geographic area. You know, the geographic area in North Andover, Andover and Lawrence, if you put a circle just around that area, it's not very large. We have fairly large geographic communities, but if you took South Lawrence at three square miles, our impacted areas are probably a little less than that, and Andover is at three square miles. Putting 195 crews in 11 square miles, that's why I start telling people, uh, be careful of traffic. You're going to get a lot of traffic, and we're working with them to make sure we don't disrupt school and drop off uh, because the magnitude of the staff to get it done in a safe way will be substantial, and the oversight of those crews will be substantial. So I, I feel comfortable that all those questions were answered, and the plan was not rolled out till they could be addressed. I have to tell you, it was extremely noticeable to see in the streets of North Andover all the um, gas professionals from all over. Um, in my area in particular, they were from Indiana. Um, and I, I don't want to give people just real excitement or false hope. They were not reinstalling people. They were mocking the gas lines. I asked them, and that's what they, that's what they were doing. But they, were, they came from Indiana. So when you see them, please thank those out-of-towners that, uh, that came to help us out. They, it, it was like almost, on, it seemed like it was almost on every street. So it was really, um, it was pretty comforting to say, wow, you know, they're, they're really getting in there and working hard to fix this as quickly as possible. So 
But it uh, doesn't mean you're all getting your gas tomorrow. It means that they're getting ready. Um, my last question is more just a thing to put on the board to discuss at a later point, um, as I'm sure you don't have the numbers now, but um, it will be, I guess, an action to look at what's the cost impact of this to us as a town in terms of all the overtime and resources expended. A good segue. I assume so, you uh, don't have it. I do not have that because it's, it's, um, it's evolving. Yeah. Um, Lynn Savage, of course, as a finance director, is the person responsible for coordinating uh, making sure each of the departments are tracking costs accordingly um, and and she's the right person to be in charge of that and we will make sure that we continue to track costs uh, again this was a Columbia gas event this was not a town of North End event it affected of our residents affected our residents and affected what we do on a daily basis and will continue quite frankly to affect on what we do for the next um, eight weeks or so um, we do not expect to come out of this having incurred one nickel beyond what we would have if we we're doing something else so Great. we're going to track it and we're going to push to make sure that that's the case Wonderful. any final questions I think yes please no. sorry sorry <laughs> well that's <laughs> a great thing you had already gone no, no, that's a great thing about having a team everybody brings their own perspective but collectively i think we've expressed uh, our gratitude it's awesome the sense from the community very powerful the one thing that occurs to me as you were explaining about the process with this all and it is something that you in particular um, I think command and that is the you call the belts and suspenders the, the backup the contingency plans the one thing I haven't heard anybody talk about with this which is what happens when there's a disagreement what happens when Columbia Gas says, this is what we say is reasonable, and the consumer, our fellow townsfolk say, that's not what it costs, or I don't think that's reasonable. Has there been thought about what that process will be, and um, how would that be um, mediated, arbitrated? Because from a practical standpoint, if you have 1,500 people who have a problem to be solved, they're going to be on a continuum of very satisfied to unsatisfied, and hopefully most everybody's in the middle. But what's the thought process behind that? Yeah, I mean, without getting too technical, but I would say this: that there are there are folks who who um, very few folks. Let me say the response. I'm sorry, I saw that. <laughs> I'm yeah. just really terrified now. Yeah, we all of a sudden. Yes, yeah. it's probably venting. You wanna? Check, see where he's going. It's always great to have your facility director at a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Never know. And our fire chief. We're right on it. <laughs> Sorry. It was just instant. Though. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like just like, if you hear a pop, run out. It's a little late for the venting, but it could be. So, um, <laughs> try to answer that while folks are a little distracted. <laughs> no, I appreciate <laughs> yeah. Appreciate that. See, I didn't have an answer, so we distracted folks a little bit. The, uh, so I, I, I would say this, so that, so that um, there is a real benefit in the way the process has evolved to date. And what I mean by that is the fact that the, the, the town manager in Andover and the mayor of Lawrence, uh, they're supporting um, political groups, your, your folks, um, and the, the board in uh, Andover and the council in Lawrence, the governor's office and all of the staff. There is a real benefit for us continuing to work together. And the benefit is in the end is to leverage solutions when there are complications. These, some of these conversations have not yielded the outcomes we want. And yet I think we're in okay, in an okay space now. It's like the Saturday, here's what we're covering, which was a lot of those folks in the room. So what I, I guess I'm saying is, as we stay united with a group of three communities and the governor's office and all these other folks that are here, uh, federal folks and state folks, um, that coalition provides the strength to solve the kinds of problems that we do think eventually will arise. Uh, and uh, and I, that's what I expect seems like a harsh word, but that's what you've proven so far and I think it's, it's working very well. I do think that's in the back of people's heads in terms of because um, there's an element of trust that is now required 
in terms of following through sure. a, 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 as promised. So um, wherever that can be in the discussions collectively, I guess I'm just advocating for that um, in preparation. Hopefully we won't have to apply it, but just kind of knowing human nature and the challenges, um, being sure. prepared. And I think there'll be a point in which some of that stuff can be resolved through mm -hmm. negotiation and leverage and right. goodwill, and there'll be some of those things that end up in places where I don't visit, courtrooms. Yep, understand. Uh, but we'll try to manage through the ones that affect our residents the most. And thank you again Great. for all you've done. All good. As I was just going to close this discussion, if we're done with all of our questions, there's been a lot of gratitude expressed to our first responders and all the different department heads and volunteers and so many people who have worked tirelessly on this, but I think it's appropriate to close with a humongous thank you to you, our town manager, for your absolute, I mean, unwavering dedication to North Andover, spending literally 24 hours a day, it feels like, here since this has happened, and you've, you've been extraordinary, so thank you very much you. for the service. And your leadership. Yes, your leadership, you absolutely. Might to get to a sweater like the blizzard of 78, that <laughs> yeah. they, the, the, the famous sweater, but it was a little warm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if residents have some questions. That you know. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, yes, residents. Oh, questions. <laughs> Uh, Donald Stewart, 52 Prospect Street, uh, two months shy of my 78th birthday. Mm -hmm. I am so proud of this town as a townie for the first responders, police, fire, uh, Jeff Coco and his crew. Even today, the town hall, people are answering phones trying to help people out. It's not their job. Where, where do you get Mr. Mayor's overtime bill. You'll be no. honest, you know? He wishes. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, want, I want to th th thank everybody for it. And the first responders, I think it's been a, it makes you proud to live in this town. And, and Mr. Mr. Chairman, could I have one leeway on a, a comment, please? Sure. Okay. Ray, is this, when's your last day? Friday. Friday. A quick little story, okay? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. 20 odd years ago, Mark Reeves was the town manager, and Mr. Santilli came for his job. I gave you 20. I gave you, it seems like, seems like, seems like 20. Okay? And what happened was Bill, du no, sorry, Bill Duffy decided he wanted to go interview Mr. Santilli. So as usual, we go down to interview him, and of course, Bill does all the talking, because I don't say anything. I just sit there and I just look at him. And, and what happens is we leave the meeting for five minutes, right, 10 minutes? And Bill Duffy says to me, he says, what'd you think? I paused him in, I says, he's gonna be a pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, Bray, you've come full circle. <laughs> and I'll still bring you donuts. And Thank I ain't you. gonna step around for that gas smell, sorry. I'm Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other, actually, I have a question. Yes. Um, um, this just, I didn't intend to have a question, but I actually do after I heard everything. So Anna Choi, 70 Maple Avenue. Um, so just, because you know, there's always full disclosure and everyone's trying to get as much information as you can. Is there any way that the residents who do intend to convert to propane or get an electric water heater can have a list of available people to do that? Because I think it's, I personally don't have to, but I know people who intend to do that. And it would be nice if they're not competing with the same five plumbers or the, you know, the same 10 regional you know, companies that do that because they may have the money, they may even borrow the money from the town, and with the money in hand, they don't have the people to come into their homes to do it because there's not that, that many. So if there's a list of, you know, Merrimack Valley plumbers, Merrimack Valley electricians or whatever for uh, townspeople to access so that they can have the people come in to do that to their homes. So that's just a question whether you could do that and have that available. Great question. So there's uh, certain things we uh, can't, don't do, and, and one of those is to identify vendors. But uh, with your suggestion, I can talk to the Merchants Association and the Merrimack Valley Chamber of Commerce and have them list people in their in groups who, who are licensed in either plumbing or electrician. We can't do that because we can't look as if we're influencing who gets work. Right. Uh, but we can try to do that with those two groups. NAMS probably has a group of electricians. Have them put them on their website. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and direct people to those websites if they're looking for folks. Right. Yeah, it's a good Or question. maybe even do like an all hands on deck, you know, even beyond Merrimack Valley. 
Yeah, we just, we, we yeah. can't center that. Or we, they could. They could, right. <laughs> right. So, but, I, but I will communicate with them about doing okay. that. That's okay. That's great. It's great, because there will be, there will be a real challenge. If you can imagine, um, this process requires several hundred electricians and plumbers. Right. It's going to be a real challenge for residents to compete for those same services. Mm -hmm. And it's part of the reason there is reasonable in the words put out in terms of claims. Because if you bump into a situation and you really want to do it and, the, and replacing the water heaters, you know, whatever it is, I'm picking number 1,500. But you find the plumber that's going to do it at 5,000. That's not going to be considered reasonable. And we're going to have a hard time challenging those kind of things. Right. Uh, so everybody's going to be competing. It's a very fair point. Yeah. Yeah. Any other resident questions? Go home. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for, for coming in. Thank you, guys.
did not even officially say motion that. To, uh, <laughs> motion to uh, reconvene. Motion to reconvene. Motion to reconvene. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. We are back in session. Okay. Where were we? Um, hours for Halloween. We have a notice from the police department in our packets about the hours for Halloween, suggested to be 5.30 to 7.30 on the 31st. I would move approval. I'll second. Any discussion? I hope that's enough time for all the trick-or-treaters. Mm -hmm. That's what we normally do every year, though. Yeah, 5.30. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, I, my, my light stays on a little bit. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, maybe not this year, but we'll sit on the front steps or something. We'll figure it out. Okay. Um, okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Oh, it wasn't even a vote. It was just no. a communication. Anyway. Okay. That's great. Um, oh, took a stand. If you guys will allow us, I will take a couple of items out of order to allow those who are here in person for specific items to get to get on with their evening. So we'll move to the request of Dan Pass to hold the MDA fill the boot drive on Saturday, October 13th at the roundabout at the Town Common from 9 to 2 p.m. Dan, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, how you guys doing this evening? Good. Hey, thanks. I didn't recognize you without your uniform. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to blend in when I came in. I'm looking for permission from you guys to run uh, Boot Drive again this year. Um, they gave us Saturday, October 13th at the Rotary. Uh, it is a rain or shine event. Um, since I took it over in the past three years, we've raised over $11,000 for MDA. The 100% profit goes straight to them. So. <laughs> We're just looking for permission from you guys to continue on. A second? I'll second that with our thanks for doing this. Yep. Mm -hmm. All volunteers, we all volunteer our own time for this. So. Great. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. And um, now I will move quickly to the proclamation of Indigenous Peoples Day. Since we have Ms. Picard here, I assume she's here for that. I know, I feel bad that they left. I was going to try and get to it as soon as we got back. Um, so, if everyone will remember, we discussed um, when Ms. Picard and others came to our meeting um, several meetings ago to make the suggestion that we recognize Columbus Day also as Indigenous Peoples Day, and there was a lot of community support in the meeting for that, and we agreed to make a proclamation um, in that order. On the in the meeting prior to our prior to Columbus Day, so I will read that proclamation. Whereas the town of North Andover recognizes that the indigenous peoples of the land that would later become known as the Americas have occupied these lands since time immemorial and values the progress our society has accomplished through American Indian technology, thought, and culture. And whereas the town of North Andover understands that, that government entities, organizations, and other public institutions should update their policies and practices to better reflect the experiences of American Indian people and uplift our country's indigenous roots, history, and contributions. And whereas Indigenous Peoples Day was first pro proposed in 1977 by a delegation of Native Nations to the United Nations, sponsored International Conference on Discrimination Against Indigenous Populations in the Americas, and whereas in 1990, representatives from 120 Native nations at the First Continental Conference on 500 Years of Indian Resistance unanimously passed a resolution to transform Columbus Day into an occasion to strengthen the process of con continental unity and struggle towards liberation and thereby use the occasion to reveal a more accurate historical record. And whereas the United States federal government, the state of Massachusetts, and the town of North Andover recognized Columbus Day on the second Monday of October in accordance with the federal holiday established in 1937. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Selectmen that the town of North Andover shall also recognize Indigenous Peoples Day on the second Monday in October. Be it further resolved that the town of North Andover shall continue its efforts to promote the well-being and growth of the American Indian and Indigenous community. Be it further resolved that the Indigenous Peoples Day shall be used to reflect upon the ongoing struggles of indig Indigenous peoples on this land and to celebrate the thriving culture and value that Indigenous nations add to our town. 
Be it further resolved, the Town of North Andover encourages other businesses, organizations, and public entities to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day in conjunction with Columbus Day. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the Town of North Andover to be affixed this 24th day of September in the year 2018. So, there we have it. I will sign that item. <laughs> Yes, you can. Okay. So now we will move back to the rest of the consent items, if you don't mind, and then, and then go to licensing just to keep those in order. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next item we had was to waive the permit fees for residents and businesses impacted by the gas incident. And in chair motion for approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I would uh, abstain. Ah. Yes, okay, four in favor, one abstain. Motion passes. Uh, the next item is to grant the town manager authority to approve gas petitions for repair work. Um, <laughs> we obviously don't want to be a, a hindrance in the timeline. <laughs> yeah. Motion approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll abstain again. One abstention. Motion passes. Four. Yes. Next item is um, a letter to the Division of Local Services to deficit spend under, under MGL Chapter 40, Section 31. This. Uh, something that we're, we're, there's certain things that we're doing to make sure we're positioned uh, for every resource we need. We do not expect that we'll need to deficit spend. It's early in the fiscal year, with good robust budgets in the departments that will be impacted, but uh, something we do just in case and, and again, I, uh, we will be tracking the costs. I think in the, in the end of the day, any costs that we incur will be re reimbursed before a deficit would be created. But this, there's certain things going on in the background, sort of these administrative things that you'll see maybe on future agendas as well, to make sure that we're protecting the town as it relates to parts of this incident. This is one of those. Good. Um, all those in favor? Oh, no. Do I'll I hear a motion? Um, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, the next item is several appointments. Um, do you want to yeah. read these? So we have uh, uh, Chairman Valancourt, I'm uh, sorry, Selectman Valancourt, and I have been uh, very busy uh, meeting, again, tremendous folks. And uh, it, what's really been amazing is the, just kind of the, the breadth of uh, age, interest, expertise, across all these committees. So we have eight folks who we would ask uh, our fellow selectmen to uh, appoint. Uh, we have uh, to the Sustainability Committee, uh, Kevin Craig, uh, uh, Jessica uh, Pimentel, Elvin Pimentel, uh, and Favish Star, all to the Sustainability Committee. Uh, Jeff Clark to the Patriotic Observance Committee who uh, Kind of rolled up his sleeves uh, this past uh, two two weekends ago. Uh, Frank Kalea to um, the Zoning Board of Appeals as an associate member. Uh, Jennifer uh, Ezzi to the Council on Aging and Ellen Mosier to the Stevens Estate Advisory Board. All great people. Yeah, let me just say, and all very well qualified for the positions that they've applied for. I mean, we could go into detail on each one of these, but I think, and I think you'd be very impressed, but um, they've all are very well qualified for these positions. So, uh, and, and I think, again, you know, we'd like to thank all the volunteers that we have in town um, that step up and become part of these committees and boards and, and spend their own time to do this. And, you know, it really is something that makes our town a really great place to live, work, play, and learn. So thank you to all these people for stepping up. So I move that uh, the Board of Selectmen approve uh, the letter to, I'm sorry, approve uh, all these folks who we have uh, listed uh, to the board as noted. And I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Okay, now we could uh, jump back to licensing if you want. Okay. Madam right. Chair, I'll make a motion we move to licensing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're in licensing. Um, first is a 
um, request from Ashley Piazza of Small Lake Farms for a one day wine and malt license for a dinner in the tent on Thursday, October 11th, 2018 from 5 to 8 p.m. in our packet. We have uh, all the documentation uh, satisfactory for that. Is there any discussion around this? Uh, Mr. Chair, on the, uh, on the agenda it says until 9 p.m. 9 p.m., thank you for the clarification. Yes, until 9 p.m. I'll hear a motion. Motion for approval. Are you a second? Um, Any just, more discussion? Yeah, I would just like to um, emphasize in that motion that this is a weeknight mm -hmm. and 9 o'clock is the, is the shutoff time and that they would uh, make sure that they use their quiet cleanup hours or recognize the fact that they need to be quiet during their cleanup hours. It is a, uh, it is a school night, I mean a, a weeknight and they need to ensure that they, their cleanup hours are, are quiet and that they terminate at 9 p.m. exactly. No, no bleeding over. Yeah. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion around this location and assurances from them to attend to that. So, um, We're all good. noted on that. Up. Thank that you. That being all clear. You're all set. Oh, come back. Call me again. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, so, um, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay. Um, we have a request from uh, Paul Gallant of Merrimack College for 10 one-day wine and malt licenses for concessions at the Athletic Center on Friday, November 2nd uh, from 5 to 10 p.m., Friday, November 9th from 5 to 10 p.m., Friday, November 16th from 5 to 10 p.m., Saturday, November 17th from 3 to 8 p.m., uh, Friday, November 23rd from 3 to 8 p.m. Saturday, December 1st from 3 to 8 p.m. Friday, December 7th from 5 to 10 p.m. Saturday, December 8th from 1 to 9 p.m. Friday, December 28th from 5 to 10 p.m. And Friday, December 31st from 3 to 8 p.m. Uh, and there's also uh, concessions at the Rogers Center on December 28th from 5 to 10 p.m. Is there any discussion? Nobody here is to represent to this? No? Motion approval for the requested 11 one-day wine and malt licenses as presented. Okay. Second. Uh, um, so I, I yes, do sir. have a question uh, uh, with respect to discussion. So these <clears throat> um, are listed as being requested for the Paul uh, for um, where is it concessions at the athletic center? Mm -hmm. um, can we get a clarification? What is the athletic center, and how are they going to be served? Are they, are they going to have a roped off, tented off area for this, or is it going to be served within whatever they define as the athletic center? Because I think uh, in the past we've always, um, or they've always used a tent in area that's roped off and secure, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they obviously they card everybody going in, they issue uh, wristbands and such, but I'm just wondering if what they mean by athletic center and mm -hmm. if they would have a roped in uh, tented off area for serving the alcohol. It says in the form that there will be no tent, so. So they're just, they're just gonna serve it within the, confines of the athletic center which is what is that we'll get more information yeah can we just get clarification the details that will certainly change time okay yeah. then i see that. okay then i would suggest we put these on hold until we get that information what's the okay. feeling so of the body i withdraw my motion Uh, Do I withdraw my second? I don't know how that yes. works. <laughs> yeah, I just made a motion to, to table yeah, the um, 10 requests. Um, I'm okay with the 11th. The concession at the Rogers the Center. Yeah. So why don't we just table so, that motion and then make a motion for the concessions at the Rogers Center. So, right, technically so we I made a motion for all I of them. I second Selectman Valancourt's motion to table right. 1 through 10. Are you second? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay. So I'll hear a motion regarding the Rogers Center. 
I'll move that we approve concessions of the Rogers Center on Friday, December 28th from 5 to 10 p.m. Uh, yeah. One day license. All right. so. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, and uh, our last, uh, we have a request from Deborah Ingalls for two one day all alcohol liquor licenses for events in the tent at Smolak Farms. Uh, the first is a corporate dinner on Thursday, again another weeknight from 4 to 8 p.m. on October 4th, as I said, and then a wedding on Saturday, October 6th uh, from 4 to 10 p.m. Are there any questions or concerns around this? Nope. I'll move approval of the two one-day all liquor licenses for events the tenant at Small Act Farms as presented. Second. And then I'm just going to reiterate my prior comment that during the cleanup period, they would um, ensure that there's no noise and no music during the cleanup mm -hmm. period, and that the times that they specify are the exact times that they end the, the events. Yeah. I would also note, uh, again, kind of uh, tight to the wire with this request. Um, it just, we'd like a little more notice so we don't have to rush around. And the events of last week sort of add to the fact of where that can be a challenge when we've got a lot of other things going on. So um, I think a follow-up discussion is probably due about timing with them. Okay. Um, any other discussion regarding this? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed nay, passes unanimously. Um, I'll hear a motion to move out of licensing. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're out of licensing. Okay, moving back to our agenda, the next item is new business. Um, we have the dedication of benches in front of Town Hall. Um, looking back over the course of last year, I think we've had a couple of occasions where we've recognized some um, amazing contributors to our town who have been just dedicated and committed to volunteering their time to the town for really you know, their entire lives. <laughs> um, and at one point or another, we had discussed how we could honor these folks, and, and I would put forth, I guess, a discussion for us to um, dedicate bench benches in front of Town Hall for those folks, and, and that would be one would be Charlie and Martha Salisbury, and the second one would be Jim and Carrie Crouch for, um, sorry, did I? Ken, Ken and Carrie. Ken, Ken, sorry, Ken and Carrie, thank you, um, for the contributions that, that they've given to the town. Um, I think they'd both be very deserving of those that honor, um, and I just wanted to throw it out there. Our discussion. I think you framed it really well. We're not talking just a couple of years. We are talking decades of public service. A lot of it is under the radar that people you only know because you know them or you we couldn't even begin to write all the stuff that those mm -hmm. both couples have given to the town. It's just I think it's a wonderful idea. Any we other will want to write them that? down because I think that it's a good opportunity. <laughs> To, we will to highlight. We do. Martha we, and, yeah, we do. We need Charlie to. And we need Ken to give the list. Yeah. It was a good idea. Yeah. Ben and if, I think that it's a. We did it last year um, with one of our former selectmen, and it's true. I mean, these aren't. There are so many people that put so much work into this community, but these are people who you really can point to and say these things wouldn't have happened if it weren't for them absolutely. and their care for this community. Yeah. So absolutely. It's a moving tribute. Okay. So. I don't have this on here. Any other comments as to well, that idea? Well, the only idea? comment that I would like to do make is uh, if for Ken and Carrie, if we could do it before October 24th, which I believe is the date they're planning on moving mm, away. So yes. if we could get uh, something put together before that. I know it's short notice, but I think we can, mm -hmm. I think we can pull it off. I know. And what Charlie about Charlie? Is, he's in town. I don't know for how much longer those two. So you're, what date was it? I didn't hear you. 24th. I think October 24th is the date that uh, Carrie said she would be leaving the town and moving. Um, I wonder if, if we could do something. What's our next meeting? The 9th. The 9th. So we could possibly put something on our agenda for the 9th to, do we have to vote on this, I guess? Is this no, a voting matter? Let's, yeah, if we could just yeah, try to find out who's local. If you want the actual Black. thing done by yeah. I don't know what their time frame is. 
Could you look into the time frame for getting the? I also need to know what it has. Yeah. yeah, because yeah. How do they, yeah, do they want it? Does it, does it want to be Charlie Salisbury or Charles? Everyone knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of important. Well, yeah, we can look into that. Okay, so we'll take an action to look into exactly the wording we would put on the plaque and how long it would take, and if possible, we will try and do something in our next meeting or. I don't think we would have another meeting at, besides the next meeting before they leave town, but no. we'll, and I don't we'll think attempt. We, we don't need a vote on the language. Right. We just should find out what would be the most appropriate. Okay. I think it's great. I'm really, I'm really excited about that for both, great. both couples. All right. If there's no other comments on that, we will move forward to the town manager's report. Great. First, uh, let me uh, recognize the fact that the housing production plan has been approved. So we have a formal housing production plan, which of course is inco incorporated into the master plan, but it's a, it's a good uh, sort of success. We have started the process. Believe it or not, there, there are other things we continue to move forward with. Uh, the capital improvement planning process has begun, um, and we've gotten out documents to departments about capital improvement requests for fiscal uh, 2020. Um, and I know that we're we're trying to work through making sure we have a strategic planning session so that in some time in the month of October we can uh, get to the point that we have a budget policy statement and start to kick off the budget process. And I know we're moving um, forward with that. With that, we've already selected an owner's project manager for the uh, senior center project. We're getting close in the next uh, week or so to be able to select an architect. We had a great response. I think eight firms responded to the request for qualifications for an architect, which is great. Um, and several of them had, had experience with building senior centers, which is all good. And so we're moving forward on that project. And I, and I do know that although there's, there's one or two meetings left on the fields project before mm -hmm. uh, that gets formally put out the bid, which hopefully is over the winter. So we have some other things certainly that are ongoing and we continue to work uh, through those to make sure that they're done. And although I didn't, I, my, my uh, schedule originally had me not here at this meeting and I was, uh, thanked Ray last meeting. I'll thank him once again. He's here. So uh, this is Ray's last meeting. We appreciate mm -hmm. the contributions he's made over the last 17 or 18 years to the town, and, and um, he will be missed. He will absolutely be missed. And I'm, guess, whatever question. Um, yeah, sure. Well, I, I think Ray and I kind of came on about the same time. Um, I think the one question that we both remember, I said, so how long? How long will you commit to stay? And he told me five years. So no, you said five years. <laughs> well, would it be at least five years? And you said yeah, something like that. You told me five years too. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just didn't want one and done, uh, one year and out. Um, it's fine. You've worked hard. You've had some really awful, challenging jobs, but you took them and you did a good job with them, and uh, especially with the building the different building projects, and you should be really proud of that. Thank you. Um, so thank you. Thank you to your family. And um, we wish you a really happy and wonderful retirement there, Grandpa. Or thank is it you. Nunnel? No, no. Yeah. Dick, met, Dick and Phil met my granddaughters yesterday. Very oh, beautiful. That's great. And, and, and I don't think you can understand, again, how much uh, uh, of all the new buildings going on in town, how you know you were the backbone of all getting those all done and getting them done on time, on budget, or and under. just are under budget, and just a fantastic job. I mean, I think you know people don't realize that, but you were the, the backbone of getting that all done. So Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, best wishes in your retirement. I know you've got a busy fall with soccer refing and everything else. And then uh, we'll see what the next chapter holds, right? So good luck and thanks for all your Thank contributions. It's an expression, Ray, jack of all trades, master of none. And <laughs> I often use the term jack of all trades with you. And the funny thing is you probably are actually more a master of quite, quite a few things that you never expected you'd have to dive into as the assistant town manager. I was not around 17 years ago, not in this role, certainly. Um, Grandma's school. Grandma's school. Grandma yeah. school. We don't know. Yeah. 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 Elementary. Yeah. Where was I? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But um, middle school. As as a selectman, I appreciate that when I joined this board, um, you were more than willing to help um, steer me in the right direction when it comes to process, and I appreciate that. And I appreciate the sense of humor you always brought to any issue because I think a lot of times it made it a lot easier to deal with those issues. So thank you. Did thank you. Did you start the conversation with 
with all due respect. And you know, I was always told really I was one of his five favorite selectmen, and I will wear that as a badge oh, of I honor. Got that one. Because <laughs> I'm sure there are many people. I, I don't know. I, it would probably actually be pretty easy to count, but there are many people that you sat with up here. So I appreciate that. I'm as you leave. I'll explain that to you later when he said yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Dick got exactly the explanation once. <laughs> thank you. Um, but thank you. Thank you. I thank you for sitting with me at the MMA meeting at 7.30 a.m. when no one told me that the selectmen don't go. It's <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear the woman from Ireland? You know, every year. She was very entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, you, that was your indoctrination. Go, that was your indoctrination. Right. Yeah. Bluebird got gotcha. no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you volunteer. And, and I would just say, you know, going back to uh, you know, your, 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 your motherland, and that's where, where my family's from, too, uh, they could probably use a good project manager there, I bet. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the opportunities might be great for, you know, another, another career there. Thank you. Uh, they would certainly benefit by that. Okay, Thank you. He thinks he's fluent. Maybe he can go and actually, you know, try out the language. <laughs> All of us. Thank you. Uh, quick question on the other things you mentioned. Yes. The um, senior center and having selected a project manager, do you have an idea when you would um, convene a group, I guess, of people to give input to the senior center yeah, that design? Would be, I don't uh, know. I mean, yeah, assuming, assuming there would be some sort of working group. Of there will be a working group, and then I, this project will be a little different than the rest. I think there will be a couple of other um, opportunities as groups to contribute. So I would expect a working group, you know, within the next 30 days, and then I would expect um, whether they're public input sessions in the truest way, or whether they're uh, convening of various of the groups that meet down in the senior center for the architect and the OPM to meet with those groups to get input in terms of building the program, which is really the goal, right? So the architect and OPM really build the program. What does the facility look like? Uh, so I think we're going to look at a little different than the other projects, multiple ways to reach to people because one of the groups we also want to reach to are the people, say, in their 50s that aren't right. yeah. yet using the center but may use the center, yeah. you know, a year or two after it opens, making sure that the center reflects not only the current uh, users of the center but the yeah. folks who will use it. In the, yeah, so so we're, we're going to uh, develop what I would expect is a handful of so or so ways to gather community input by those people who use the center today or we'll use it in the future so that it can be incorporated into the broader program. So I would expect that process will happen uh, more than 30 days and less than 100 day, 20 days from now. And then um, obviously a working group trying to work with those two to, to bring that program down. And then we come da down to um, some of the, uh, you know, sort of streetscape and exterior improvement things coming back to the board and getting feedback. Yeah. And then you also mentioned there'd be one or two field meetings before we go out to bid. Because that's not like an official committee, I don't know that the agendas or meeting dates are posted necessarily. Are they? I just want to make sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, all those yeah. are posted. They just don't have a schedule. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We do post. We all 20 have been posted. Yeah, okay, good. Definitely posted, and uh, yeah. there was a there's meeting scheduled for Thursday. Oh, yeah. Thursday. When? But it's, no, it's, this not, it's no. Did they move it? Clark, give a second. Yes, because it just too many conflicts with too many people. Okay, because um, I was at the Atkinson PTO meeting last week, last week, and there was um, you know a fair amount of question and just thoughts about how does the middle school field work impact Atkinson and so forth. And I, and I advise those people um, to attend one of these meetings or give yeah. their feedback to one of the members. And I. I let people know that you were on that committee, um, Rosemary. So timeline thing, right? Yeah. How, how I think the sequencing the work of the middle school will be, uh, for instance, so, so the senior center project, the sequencing won't be a big deal because because you have a facility for them today for the senior center, and you're mm -hmm. building on a different site. Yeah. The sequencing on the middle school fields project will be more complicated because right. uh, you know do you work from the back of the site forward? How do you time around that? I've, I have sent that off to Rick Green and to the people involved for, as uh, things to think about. What's the sequencing, you know, those kind of mm -hmm. things. And that will be a little more challenging on that project. Yeah. The, the, the actual groundwork won't be compli as complicated there as building a structure from the ground, mm -hmm. but the sequencing won't be more challenging on that side. And it, the focus has been what would be um, the less uh, impact on the schools and stuff. They're trying right. to figure out a way that you would do, do certain ones at one time, others at another. Yeah. Because it's just not to impact the normal operations of the schools. Yeah. 
during construction. And one of the reasons, too, that I think that uh, we decided to do it a quicker process is not to have this long drawn off right. thing so of years right. of no phases right and you know what it was a really good decision yes. so yes. okay Great. sorry so we get there. Don't have any questions okay. any other questions you may have for me no Great. okay any we've made a lot of selectman comments already but we'll round table for any final selectman comments anyone uh, just a great job again by the association putting on the fall festival this past weekend. I think they had a, a great day for it, and it got people out and probably mined off their troubles with the gas issues for a little while, and they had a good turnout. And also yesterday, the Artisans Fair and the uh, the Farmers Market again, a great great turnout and a great event. So. Yeah, it was a busy weekend between the fall festival and the Farmers Market and the Artisan, which was yeah. um, a lot of people. A lot of people. We kept people busy downtown, which during this time is important to remind folks that if they are going to go out and spend some extra money, think of doing it in town especially. Always think of doing it in town, but really right now we have more than a handful of businesses that are still struggling. Um, even those that are back up and running have to recover and recoup mm -hmm. those costs. And um, as great it is, as it is that we're, we are recovering quickly, it's um, there are definitely business owners that are hurting, and hurting a lot, actually. So um, thank you for getting the governor um, to give them some face time so that they could air some of their grievances and so that he could understand what they're going through here in North Andover, Mr. Manager. Um, but just a reminder, shop local. Okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. We have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.